This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to episode 193 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta, and today's sponsor is Private Internet Access. If you've ever surfed the web and wanted to do it securely, especially when you're traveling or uh, using someone else's uh, network, you definitely need Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access allows you to have a secure VPN without them logging what data you're, what you're doing, what transactions you're making, or anything like that to connect to anywhere in the world. You can also change your default location so it appears as if you're coming from a different place. Why is this helpful, you say? If you're not doing anything nefarious, well, it's really helpful if you want to test DNS resolution from different places and different time zones. Um, It's a really cool tool and it's not very expensive at all. You can get plans starting at $3.99 a month and you can find out more by going to ageekleader.com slash VPN. Again, that's ageekleader.com slash VPN. All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I've got Jonathan Raven, and he is the author of a book of good authority and the CEO of Refound. He uh, has learned a little bit about what it takes to uh, be a good executive the hard way uh, and how that you know, incorporating you know, your team and working with people can help you be more human rather than less. Uh, he's also a surfer, which we'll talk about maybe a little bit, and the uh, proud dad of two amazing girls. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Hey, John. Thanks for having me on. If you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are today and uh, what are you doing and what does Refound do? Sure. Uh, I started out in a pretty technical profession in, in uh, the law. Uh, so after graduating law school, I went into kind of big firm legal practice and highly technical kind of corporate and finance work. And uh, the organizations that I was, that I was in were, were very uh, deeply inhumane. And uh, I was really unhappy. I was pretty depressed and really just not in a good place in my life. And I decided to move out to the West Coast and I got involved in tech and clean tech and mobile tech and um, some other things like that, but mostly in business development roles. And then uh, over time, what I realized was that uh, I had a passion for two things that uh, I ultimately figured out how to get them to go together. Uh, One was for entrepreneurialism and growing businesses, and the other was for growing people and helping people uh, unlock better versions of themselves. And so uh, my current career really started in about 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. Uh, I took over as the CEO of an executive coaching company. And I worked there for about five years before I created ReFound, where I really sort of found my sweet spot of like working at the intersection of personal and professional growth. Okay. So I've had many different um, coaches and executive coaches on the show, which talked about different things. What do you think is one of the key um, benefits that, you know, a mid manager or a relatively new leader would get from, from trying to get a coach? There's a couple. I mean, these days it's like uh, what I've seen in the last 18 months, especially with COVID is that a lot of the things that organizations have been subtly or, or, or in small ways asking managers to do to become better coaches, to give more effective feedback, to have more effective one-on-ones, like all those things people have been talking about for some years now. Uh, but COVID really sort of like ripped the cover off the necessity to become a better coach, to become a more active listener, to learn how to create the conditions for other people to grow. And in our world and most organizations and most teams are not set up well to allow you to do that. And so having a coach in some form or another, right? There's a lot of different ways to think about it, but having a coach uh, is, can be incredibly helpful if it's the right person and the right fit uh, to help you do that. Uh, so yeah. we can get a little, a little bit more into that, but that's mm-hmm. having that outside perspective. You know, most organizations are, are a little screwed up to say the least. <laughs> so having an outside perspective and someone to help you make sense of it uh, is invaluable. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think perspective and, and you know having a different lens to look at things is important. And um, one of the things I always tell people that I mentor or talk to that, you know, when you're you're looking at things from one perspective and one set of lenses, and you really have you can't see things from a, from another person's point of view without really really you know trying really hard. Or the easier way is to have someone else kind of that you trust and can trust can can tell you the truth and tell you what right. what, what is being seen from a different lens. And that's mm-hmm. where I think a coach is so important. I mean, if you look at all the professional athletes, they have their own coaches, you know, um, 
Yeah. And it's, it, it, the coach doesn't necessarily mean that they're better than that person, but they have a different perspective and they can offer value that will improve that person's um, uh, ability. Yes, that's right. That's so right. One, of, one of the things that I know I've struggled with and, and many of the people that listen to the show also have um, found challenges is this difference, you know, the, the way we have to lead people now that, uh, you know, we're not in the office the way we were before, you know, and being remote. And I've seen um, many different instances. And we've had people on, we talked a little bit about, you know, some of the, the tactical things that you can do to make up for, um, you know, the face-to-face contact. But what are some, some challenges that you've seen in, in maybe creative ways that you've seen uh, leaders c- cope with and excel even <laughs> with the remote um, efforts that have happened because of COVID? I think there, there were, I was talking with somebody about this yesterday. I think there, there were really kind of two, two things happened at the same time. Uh, and on the one hand, uh, people uh, started having different types of conversations out of necessity. So it sort of sort of happened in the spring last year when, when you know, and some people were remote before, right? A lot of our clients are distributed teams and they, they were working remotely before, but even mm-hmm. them, uh, when COVID hit and people started dealing with all the stuff that they're dealing with, uh, the conversation changed and people started to have much more open, honest dialogue, almost out of necessity. And people, all the managers and leaders that I talked to from CEOs down to first time managers, they started reporting back to us and in, in the work that we do, you know, I'm having more personal conversations. I'm having more of these coaching conversations. I'm talking to people more about what's going on in their life. I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit, a, you know, sort of uncomfortable saying this, but I feel like I'm being a little bit of therapist, a little bit of, you know, life coach, a little bit of marriage counselor, a little bit of like, you know, foster parent. Like I'm doing all these different things uh, for all the people on my team. Uh, and there's something good about that, right? So that's kind of the first thing is that people by necessity, they started to have so much more venue in those conversations that became normal. And it became normalized to talk about and then, you know, add to the politics and, you know, riots at the Capitol and all kinds of stuff. Like people realize, you know, the, those walls of like all the stuff we can't talk about, those are just eviscerated, right? We've got to be able to find We had to find a way to be able to talk about all this stuff. So that was kind of the one thing. And then the mm-hmm. other thing that happened was people said, okay, I need structure. I need to be, it, that, that's okay on some level, but I need to know how far is too far. I need to know how to drive performance. I need to know how to not slip too deeply into some of those personal conversations. How do I make sure that I keep the focus on work, that I drive to the objectives, that I'm, that I'm bringing the team together in the right way? And how do I do both of those things at the same time, right? So how do I honor this, the, the, the very human world that we are living in, where so many of the previous boundaries, walls or otherwise are, are gone or, or dissolving? How do I honor that and be real with my people? But at the same time, I've got objectives I've got to reach. I've got people putting pressure on me for certain things. How do I do that? And so I think the call came out for more structure and, you know, how do I organize my life? How do I organize my calendar? How do I organize my meetings? Uh, What meetings should I go to? And so we've done a ton of work uh, with our clients over the last, you know, kind of 16, 18 months uh, on how to better organize uh, their Mm -hmm. worlds uh, in those digital mediums and then how to create uh, non, this is the the big thing I would say is how do you create non-transactional space? Because we're really good at that. Like we do transactions all day long. Where are we with this? Where are we with that? Project meetings, stand-ups, you know, the whole deal. But where is the space for non-transactional, like quality time, basically, right? And, you know, what, because it's in those, those, that's among the things we lost. For those of us who we used to be in office, we lost those subtle sort of contextual getting to know people, you know, those off moments. And it's really easy to have those moments be really forced in digital space and to feel cheesy and to feel like, oh, we're trying to create camaraderie. So the, so there's an art there of like, how do you create those non-transactional moments? And, and that's uh, something that, you know, we, we focus a lot with, on our, on, with a lot of our clients as part of their overall leadership development. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I know I've seen, um, I've seen some really cool things that some leaders have done, you know, to, to kind of create some of those spaces, whether it be, um, uh, you know, game night with the team on through Zoom mm. or lunches, you know, team continuing the team lunches, but doing it over Zoom these times and some creative things like uh, I've seen one, one leader that when, when their people get together for their team lunch, they do it once a month. They have like a little contest to see who can have the craziest meal, like you can have the most yeah. uh, outrageous little meal and people, you know, some yeah. people love it and some people hate it. And yeah. uh, going back to this idea, you know, 
when we had we had COVID, we had the lines blurred between what's home and what's at work, and and then we also had you know the the um, riots at the Capitol, the, all the race you know conversations. How do you know when a person you know you should talk about those things and, and when you should? Mm. Because I, I've yeah. fallen into some traps where you know you, you know when uh, George Floyd happened, I made it a point to talk to. Um, the, my direct reports that were African Americans on a one on one basis just to find out how they're feeling, what can I do, what am I doing wrong, mm. can, you know. And some people were very thankful and very receptive. And then I had other instances where they're like, Yeah, I don't want to, this is exhausting, I don't want to deal with it. Um, right. How, how, as a leader, have you found w- would be a good way to handle those situations to maybe figure out what is the right thing to do and what is not the right thing to do? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, I, first of all, I love that you did that, which is just wonderful. I think that there is, and, and you captured sort of both sides of it. There are some people who want to talk about it and it's helpful. And for other people, you know, it's exhausting. I was just talking with a, a black female uh, leader, uh, you know, just right before you and I started this conversation and she shared with me, you know, a really, you know, powerful, profound resignation letter from a woman, black woman in tech. And you know, and just like people just being exhausted, right? They're just exhausted from the microaggressions and the gaslighting and companies talking about diversity and inclusion and then, you know, and then not really doing anything about it. And it's exhausting, right? And in ways that you and I can't relate to. And Mm -hmm. and so I I think that the way that you do that is you've got to keep it open-ended. It's it's sort of like, uh, if any of your listeners, if you have teenagers, you know that if you like, if you pry, right? If you try to create conversation <laughs> with your teenagers, it's mostly not going to work. But if you create space and you, and you let it be known that you're available, they will come to you when they want to talk. And you've got to just accept that that conversation might be two minutes and it might be two hours. Um, and, you, and you've got to make yourself available if you value creating those kinds of spaces, which obviously, you know, I think you should, I think, you know, obviously you're, you're trying to do that with your teams. And so you've got to, you've got to do it on their time and you've got to let it be, you've got to let it be known that you're available without being pushy about it. Um, And it's, and it's difficult, right? And you'll step in it, right? Like I was talking with another uh, leader yesterday uh, who happens to be a a white, you know, middle-aged white male. And, you know, and he's like, you know, what do I do? There's a person on our extended team who's, you know, underperforming. And this person happens to be a person of color. And I don't know how to talk about it, right? It's really uncomfortable. What do I do? How do I, I don't want to be like, I'm, I, I want to be supportive. And, you know, like there's so many of these nuances and there's so many things, you know, just to you know, kind of go into the, into that space for a moment. It's really challenging. And the, the advice that I often find myself giving to people is to acknowledge the challenge itself before you go to the solution. And this is something that, you know, engineers and technical people like everyone else really struggle with is we think, well, I can't open that box unless I have the solution. And and where you, what you can do is you can say, hey, there's this box over here and I don't know what to do with it. Do you, do you, does anyone else have this same problem, right? Is anybody else feeling anxiety about this box that we haven't yet opened, right? Mm -hmm. And that creates conversation. And then we can talk about the challenges of talking about it, which actually gets us closer to moving into this space of solution. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and that's a good point. It's one of those things that I learned um, a while back when it came to, you know, not being a micromanager to so not come into a meeting with, you know, orders, but come in there with curiosity and, yeah. um, and, and try to get people to talk because the more that they share the, the more diverse solution and probably the better solution you're going to get. If, you know, if, if all you do is tell people what to do, then all you're going to get is what's in your brain. You're not going to be able to expand and, you know, one person doesn't scale. And um, yes, when, yeah, I was you know, talking I, I, with a, oh. go ahead. I was going to say, I haven't, haven't thought about taking that same approach with, you know, these new life problems that can seem to yes. um, be opening up now that the, the division between office and home have kind of merged. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a principle at work here, uh, which is it has to do with authority. And that's why when I wrote the book and I, and I called it good authority, I, I, I did that very intentionally. Uh, and, and, you know, it shows up in a lot of different ways. But what there's a, the nature of authority, depending upon the team and the structure and, and the organization, uh, informs this. But what leaders will often do is they will they will bemoan or complain about the fact that other people don't share enough ideas and people don't take enough risks and there's not enough innovation happening on their teams. You know, in, in, for, in forms, big or small. 
And, and at the same time, what they do is they go into a meeting and they say, hey, everybody, uh, here's my idea. What are your ideas? Mm-hmm. And you gotta, that doesn't work, right? Because as soon as you come in with your idea, they're going to be much less likely to bring their idea, especially if their idea maybe is counter to your idea, right? So you got to go in and say, look, I have an idea, but rather than me share my idea, I'd like to get your ideas out first. I'll share my idea. I'm not hiding anything, but I just know given the nature, because I'm the leader of the team, I don't want the momentum to be that we adopt my idea just because I put it on the table first, right? Yeah. And, and, there's, and, that, and that, if you can honor that principle, you know, you, you're not hiding. It's not, it's not, you're not not being transparent. You're just honoring the nature of authority and power dynamics in an organization and saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, but I'm going to go last. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a, um, uh, a boss that had this uh, way of doing that. He kind of offered humility and a little bit of humor as he would come in. He's like, hey, here's our problem. He's like, I wrote down some things that I think, you know, might solve it, but my ideas might may make me look stupid. So I want you guys to go first, just in case my ideas right. are dumb, <laughs> you know, and kind of play it that way. That way, um, yeah, you could you do know. it like uh, like uh, any for anyone who's I'm I'm 48. I don't know anyone who's kind of around my age maybe <laughs> remembers Johnny Carson, and he used mm-hmm. to do this uh, this the fabulous Carmack this bit on, on late night TV, and he would like have the answers in like sealed envelopes, right? Like so you could like write your idea in a sealed envelope, put it on the desk, show it everybody on the Zoom or the Teams meeting, and say, hey, I'm going to open this envelope at the end of the meeting, and we'll see how dumb I look, right? And <laughs> yeah. you know, just like having a little fun at your own expense goes a long way. Yeah, I think it does too. And uh, you talked about the, the lack of people taking risks sometimes. And, and and one of the things that I found out when I was an early manager, it, nobody on my team would try anything new. They were always like afraid yeah. to try something new. And it took me like explicitly saying, you know, if you try something and it doesn't work, I will never fire you for that. But what I will fire mm-hmm. you is if you have a really good idea and you refuse to try it because you're afraid, you know, it took, yes. took me like explicitly explaining that, you know, repetitively yeah. before people would felt comfortable that they could actually do something like that. There was a great story, and a lot of people are obviously familiar with Netflix, but Patty McCord, who was the, the early kind of CHRO that was working with Reed Hastings, she tells a great story in, in her book. I forget, she has a couple of books, but I can't remember which one it was in. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, early on, and they knew each other from another, uh, from another company, she would have these moments where he would do something wrong and he would take a risk and she, would, she knew that it was the wrong thing. And then she would, he would come back to her and she would have this sort of, I told you so moment, right? And she, at the beginning, she was sort of like feeling good about herself. It's like, oh, wow, you know, like, I guess I'm, I'm as smart as him or whatever. And then after a while, she started to get really upset. She's like, I'm not doing my job, right? Like I'm failing him because I, I knew that that wasn't the right thing. And I didn't take a strong enough position early on. And I didn't take the risk to say, no, 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 we're not going to do it that way. Because that's, the, here's how that's going to blow up in our face. Right. And so she shifted her mindset around that. And I think a lot of people, you know, I talk with, you know, people about in disengagement and it's this weird, it's this weird sort of disembodied phrase or data point like around disengagement. It's like, if you don't share your opinion with the leader of your team, you're disengaged mm. and you're, you're already, whether you acknowledge it or, or not, you're already else, like you've got one foot out the door. Don't do that. Like, don't be that person. Be the person who engages and is willing to take that risk, not for the organization, screw the organization, for you, for mm-hmm. your own heart, for your own soul, for your own well-being. Take your position, find it, do it respectfully. But if you, if you won't or can't uh, find a way to share your perspective and take those risks, you're not in the right place in your life, in your career. Go somewhere else. You'll be happier. Everybody will win as a result. Yeah. So what is it? Some, let's say I'm um, a new manager and, you know, you always have to, you know, lead up and kind of lead down when you're in that middle, middle role. How is it Indeed. that I might feel more comfortable pushing back if, if I'm one of those managers, you know, who, who's afraid when, when I hear Reed Hastings, you know, say something and I know he's wrong <laughs> to, to push back right. on it because I don't have the experience yet. I haven't gone through this. Right. I just have like some ideas. That's right. So uh, we'll put, we'll put a bunch of stuff at uh, refound.com slash a geek leader. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, in, in um, with the link in the show notes, we'll put some uh, a couple of courses and some downloads and stuff that people can use that's that connects to what I'm about to say. The the tool that we teach leaders and managers, and we teach CEOs this tool, and we teach first time managers this tool, is a tool called the Accountability Doll, and it's a five step process that I detailed in the book for how to start and guide an accountability conversation. 
So it's the, the first most obvious place that you would use that is with your direct reports, right? Where you're the person who has more authority. How do I give feedback in a way that doesn't make people feel de defensive or shut down or whatever? So we have that, there's that five step process for how to think about and start and manage those conversations. But we also teach people how to use that tool for managing up and for managing peers, right? Like I have, I have a peer, I have the same amount of authority as this person. They're doing something that I don't like or that I don't think is good or I think is going to hurt us. How do I talk with them about that? Mm -hmm. And the you 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 already sort of go, started going there, John, in a, in a way, which is if I've got if I see something with somebody who's more senior than me, then in some way I've got to make sure that I have permission, right? I've got to make sure that there's a space. Now I might know that leader is has a style where I can go in and I can just kind of tell them what I think, maybe. But more often than not, or especially early on, if I'm a new manager in an organization, I've got to find a way to be a little bit softer, right? So the mention, which is the first of those five steps, is actually providing that context and saying, hey, uh, there's something that I saw, you know, in a, coming over email or, you know, in Slack or whatever the thing was. And I had, an, a, I had a perspective on it, but I don't know what's the right forum to kind of share feedback and you and just ask, right? And nine times out of 10, that leader would be like, oh, right now, the, the right forum is right now. I want to know what you have to think. And it and it and that simple offering that mention, that context of saying, hey, I, I don't want to presume that that this is the right moment makes it the right moment mm -hmm. for most of the time. And so that's a strategy and a way that you can start to build some pathways. And say, you know, hey, is that, you know, and then you can ask, hey, you know, I, I know I shared some feedback. I took a little bit of a risk here. You know, is that how I should be doing this? Is that how, you know, and and just to name for people, hey, I'm 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 the kind of person that you know, I see things and I want to be an advocate for points of view and sometimes controversial points of view. I want to make sure that I do that in a respectful way. You know, will you give can you be my partner in that? Can you make sure that I that you give me feedback if I'm doing that in a way that's not effective? And that's, uh, you know, you're, you start to make those pathways and, and build your reputation, uh, re build reputation for yourself in that way. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point, you know, to, to just ask how, how to give that feedback, because sometimes, you know, there's different forms and different managers and different leaders want, you know, feedback in a certain way. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that I, I like people just to come out and tell me, you know, be brutally right. honest, you're not going to hurt my feelings. And I think a, a lot right. of managers are like that, but a lot of direct reports feel uncomfortable you know, um, um, sharing that and, and, you know, telling the, their boss exactly how, how they right. feel about certain things. And a lot of people, even, you know, for a leader like yourself, right, you, you, have, you get people on your team or teams that have had a lot of traumatic experience with bosses who are not that way, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes time for people to accept and embrace, oh, you know what, John, John's not like that. I actually can tell him what I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I had um, an employee that worked for me one time who always kept telling me, um, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. And one day I was like, look, you're not here for me. You're here for yourself. Right. You need to be here for yourself. Yes. If you're not here for yourself, I don't want you here. I, I want you here right. for yourself and your growth. Because if all you do is just say yes to me, then I'm not benefiting from you being here. You know, I need someone that's, right. that's going to tell me no and tell me I'm wrong and tell me this is a better way and teach me too. Because if I'm not growing as a leader, then you can't take my spot. You know, you can't move that's up right. either. That's right. So, um, I think one of the things you talk about is accountability and, and archetypes and, and things like that. And I think those are a really accountability is like a really big thing that um, a lot of, I, I see it a lot in tech that we don't hold people as accountable as we should. And yes. um, it's one of those things where we feel like, Oh, it's not our place to do that. It's not our place to, right. to have responsibility. W where do you find that um, the culture of technology can maybe, maybe be adapted or improved upon to, to, to embrace, um, embrace that. One of the things that I've seen, and, and I didn't know this was going to happen when I wrote the book and, and started talking to people about accountability now is, and I've come to really appreciate how, uh, providing people structure helps with that conversation, uh, with those conversations, whether you're in tech or, you know, engineering or, or, yeah. or otherwise. And, and I think, you know, what, what, what I see happening on a lot of engineering and you know, technical teams is that uh, the, it, it boils over at a certain point where you have you know a couple of the A players who are they get resentful because right because because people aren't being held accountable. Uh, we haven't educated people about what accountability is, and so I think the failure really starts in the recruiting and hiring process 
And this is true in okay, non-technical teams as well, but we don't do a good job generally of explaining to people like what is accountability on our team? Like what are, what are my expectations? And we and we we are way over indexed on the technical requirements of the job and really under indexed on the collaborative teamwork uh, behavioral elements of the job. We don't explain what our expectations are. And we should do that in recruiting, right? And, and a lot of times, especially in startups where you know we're hiring just in time, we have an emergency need and we, and we don't give ourselves the space to think about that. So that's a problem. We've got to deal with that. Got to get out ahead as much as you can of you know, what those needs are. But mm-hmm. you, gotta, you have to set the context in recruiting, in onboarding. Hey, this is, uh, you know, we have a culture where we do feedback. What is feedback? Feedback is you know, X. We have a culture where we believe in accountability. Here's what accountability means. And the, the question that I'll often ask technical leaders, and this I think moves the needle most of the time on a, an accountability conversation, is I ask leaders to say, okay, give me someone on your team, it could be a current team, former team, and what's the behavior that you're seeing that isn't good, right? And they'll say, oh, well, this person always talks over people in meetings, or you know, they, they, they always throw, throw code over the fence without the intermediate you know, check-in step, and they just you know, they make an assumption or whatever thing is. And it's okay, great. This person's going to be doing it exactly that way in this problematic way. And they're going to be on your team doing it this way. Exactly no changes for the next 10 years. How do you feel about that? Right? Oh, God, mm-hmm. no, I don't want that. That's terrible. Okay, how about the next five years? No. How about the next one year? No. How about the next 90 days? Oh, and then, then something changes, right? And as long as we feel like a person is changing and making some incremental progress in the next kind of couple of months, We've got some, we've got some, we'll, we'll give some running room. Mm-hmm. The only problem is we haven't had that conversation with that person. Mm-hmm. So the way to shift accountability, and that's, this is step three and step four in the accountability now is to say, hey, we've had some conversations about, you know, your communication style. And I appreciate you've, you've, you've listened, even though it hasn't really changed as much as maybe I would have liked, and maybe you would have liked, let's create an agreement between you and I of what change looks like. When should that change be uh, manifest? How would we measure it? How do we know if that change is happening? And if you start to create agreements with people, and again, and the, key, the operative word is with, not consequences for people, agreements with people. Hey, what does change look like? By when? How would we measure it? What's in it for you? Right? What would get better about your world if you made this change, if you were more collaborative with your teammates? How would that make your life better? Right? And once you start making those agreements, accountability starts to shift in the organization, but you have to invest in that process in order for that to happen. Hmm. Yeah, very good. Um, it, you know, when I was looking through your book, one of the things that caught my eye, um, and actually, I think I heard it and that's what caught my ear, I guess you would say, was um, hmm. um, you had a chapter, I forget where it was, and it talked about sweat the small stuff. And mm. when, he, when he talked about sweat, the small stuff, it took me back to a TED talk that I heard probably like seven or eight years ago. And it was more about design than it was leadership. But the guy was talking about all the little small details that really make something go from ordinary to extraordinary. Mm. And, you know, I started thinking about what are the small stuff that Mia as a leader that I do and that I don't do that I probably should do that could make my team be extraordinary. You know, what could I do? That's that right. others, the little things. And what, what, what did you have in mind for that chapter as you was putting it together? Yeah, it's great. I love that you raised that. So, you know, we do this, we do this all the time when we think about products, when we think about customers. Ooh, you know, they, they did this instead of that. And just like this tiny little thing, like, oh, why did they, do? we get really curious, right? Like, why did they do that? And, you know, is that what we wanted? And what would happen if we did it differently? And let's test it and let's do a, you know, let's do a sprint to see if what would happen, you know, like we're so curious for those little things, for the small stuff when it comes to the customer experience, right? But then when it comes to the, our role as leaders, we're looking for these home runs, right? Well, how do I like, how do I transform? Like, and it's like, forget it, like stop. Like you you get feedback all the time from your team that you don't act on, right? So you hear something from, you hear a side comment from a, somebody on the team who says, like, who makes a comment about, you know, micro, being mic, feeling micromanaged or makes a comment about feeling overwhelmed or makes a comment about, you know, feeling like they don't understand the why behind a project. And we blow it off, right? We're, we're like waiting for some like shining light from the cosmos to come down and tell us what we should be working on. It's right there that they just gave you the data. That's what you should be working on. 
And whether it comes to your own leadership development that, or, or, the, or the development of someone else, I always tell people the same thing. It's like someone who's interested in growth doesn't minimize that kind of data, they maximize it. So if somebody says they're like, they're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, I have two choices as a leader. I could go, oh, well, I'm sure it'll pass. Uh, no big deal. Or I could go, ooh, I'm going to get really curious about that and be like, oh, well, if this person is telling me they're a little bit overwhelmed, the whole team, I'm going to assume the whole team is completely overwhelmed. Everybody's totally maxed out. And I'm going to, I'm going to take my next actions based on that what would I do? Oh, I'd probably start to look and, oh, maybe there's a bunch of projects that we could declutter from our inboxes that would make people have more space, more headspace for innovation and to feel more creative. I'm going to go ask some questions. I'm going to go into my next five one-on-ones from the mindset of like, oh, I'm going to listen for overwhelm. I'm going to listen for the impact of overwhelm. I'm going to listen for what could we do if people weren't overwhelmed. And I'm we, that's sweating the small stuff, right? That's in mm -hmm. taking that same amount of curiosity that we would take to a customer experience and doing that for our team culture or our own leadership development. If you want to grow as a human being, don't minimize the feedback that you're getting from people, maximize it. And I hear people say this all the time and it drives me bonkers. Well, I ask my team for feedback and they don't say anything. Baloney. They give, mm -hmm. they're, they're telling you, giving you feedback all the time. You're just not listening to that, what that feedback is and giving it the credence it deserves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of that feedback, it may not be verbal. It may be written. It may be body That's language. Right. Um, it may be showing up on time. Or, uh, um, That's right. There's, there's a ton of feedback out there. I think you're absolutely right. Um, another comment that you had in your book that that I really liked was the more Yoda, less Superman kind of uh, mm. uh, um, approach. And, um, you know, a lot of times as leaders, and I, I fell into this mistake as a new manager, that we want to solve everybody's problem. and mm. um, and, and you talked about, you know, having the ability to um, um, stand back and wait for people to, to kind of learn on their own uh, and, and the, the strength in that. Can, can you tell a little bit about, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's sort of like the vision of uh, the version of red pill or blue pill from for, uh, uh, in, our, in our world. In, in the sense that it's like it's, it, it goes as deep as you want to go. There's a yeah. there's sort of like the, the entry level concept of more Yoda less superhero is like, hey, I got to. Oh, I should probably delegate more, right? That's kind of like the more Yoda, less superhero one-on-one. -on -one. And that's true, mm -hmm. but it's so much deeper than that. And I've been working mm -hmm. with, you know, a bunch of leaders that I work with, I've been working with for years, and they keep finding like deeper and deeper layers of how they can be more Yoda, less superhero, because we are so deeply conditioned to be the superhero, to fix other people's problems, to save the day. And I would offer to say men more than women, although women do it just as well. But our conditioning as a society, we are so deeply solution oriented. And we think that that's the only way that we can add value. And that's how we define ourselves. But as a manager, as a leader, that becomes a trap, right? That, that's like mm -hmm. the worst trap there is. Because people don't want to work for somebody who solves all the problems and saves, all, and saves the day all the time. They want to, have, they want to, do, they want to win too. And so the, the, that mindset shift, we were talking about the accountability dial. That's, those are really the tactics of how to, how to do more Yoda less superhero. How do you give the feedback? How do you do the coaching? But, that, but this idea of more Yoda less superhero, how do I sit back in myself? And it doesn't mean being passive, right? If, if Yoda needs to kick some ass, he's going to kick some ass. Like that's, mm -hmm. not, that's not the problem. But he, but he or, or, or it or some people say she <laughs> understood that the highest value that, that they could add to the, to the development of someone else is to let that person struggle a little bit, let that person figure it out for themselves, let that person make some mistakes and to find, to architect opportunities that are the right learning opportunities, right? So practicing in the swamp of a little bit, right? Before you take on a, you know, X-wing fighter or, you know, to, to, look for some opportunities and, and people say, oh, oh, they say this to me all the time. I, I feel like I'm a little bit of a broken record today, but people say this, they're like, well, well, we can't do that because we got to shift this thing. We can't do this because the client's breathing down our neck. We can't do this. We're like, yes, you can. All you have to do is say, hey, this is a great thing. This is a great learning moment. We actually have to get this out the door right now, but we've got a one-on-one -on -one tomorrow. We're going to use our one-on-one -on -one tomorrow to unpack this 
and to go step by step through the process to use it as a learning moment. And I'm going to ask you some questions and we're going to use it as a little bit of a lab uh, in our one on one. You can absolutely do that the next day or even the following week. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. So don't mm -hmm. let don't let yourself fall into the excuse of like, oh, it moves too fast. We never have the opportunity to to do coaching. It's not true. Yeah, I think you're 100 percent right. I think one on ones is a perfect time to uh, you know to bring back up some of those things that you maybe didn't have time for at the at the moment because, like you said, we were behind a deadline or you had a client you had to um, meet with or something like that. But yeah, there's, there's a and there time. just yeah, there's a great question you can ask. There's a lot of great questions you can ask, but there's one great question you can ask as you can, as you do that kind of like it's sort of like a mini retrospective. Is you say, hey, so we were in that meeting yesterday, and do you remember that moment where? I asked this question, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, I remember that. Why do you think I asked that question? What do you think was behind? You know, like what was I thinking about when I asked that question? Mm -hmm. And then wait and then shut up. Like, and then like wait, give it some space and let that person think a little bit. Oh, you know what? I don't know. It just went by so fast. I didn't really think about that. That's coaching, right? That's helping somebody understand why you operate the way you do because you have some experience, you've got some gravitas, you, you've been in this moment longer than they have, and they want to learn from you. G give them the opportunity to think critically about some of your behaviors as a way to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, I like what you said there, give them space. You know, don't just jump in there with the answer. You know, give yeah. them space to figure it out. Absolutely. So what are some of the things that, um, you know, you talked about archetypes, um, friend, fixer, and fighter, I believe they were probably got that mm. in order. Um, you know, what are some ways that we as leaders can figure out kind of where we are and where people on our team may be and, 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 and understand that? Yeah. So the, the fixer fighter friend, uh, the order is not important, but, uh, the fixer fighter friend chapter in the book was a, was a, I was. I wanted to create an archetype system, and this was you know five six years ago. Uh, that didn't feel like it was pigeonholing people. Like you're a blank, and you know therefore you know take this to your grave. Uh, the the archetypes that I saw a lot, the fixer archetype is sort of the classic, like you know crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's, fix you know finds all the flaws. Right? There's like the flaw finder. That's great. I love flaw finders. That's awesome. But if that's all you know how to do. And if, you, and if your team knows that no matter what they do, you're always going to be the flaw finder, you're, you've topped out as a leader. You've got to be more diverse. The fighter is the, the leader who's always got the new idea, the fresh perspective, always asking that, like, well, what if we did this? What if we threw out that old way and we tried it this other way? That's awesome. I love fighters. They're great. But if you're the only one on the team who knows how to do that, you're, you're capped out as a leader. And then the friend is the one who's always like, hey, everybody, let's, you know, we're all on the same team. Let's do this together. And the person who's always sort of like worried about the vibe and the culture. It's awesome. I love the friend type leader. It's really important, especially these days, as we talked about at the beginning, to be sort of that cultivator or that gardener of morale. But if you're the only one who knows how to do that, if you're the one who's taking responsibility for that, you're capped out as a leader. Your team's going to suffer, especially around accountability. So, so knowing which one you are, or which one you tend to be, fixer, fighter, friend, mm -hmm. can be really helpful. There's a chapter in the book about that. There's, you know, we work on that in our with our coaching clients and things like that it can be really helpful to be able to balance. You should have a balance of all those three. Sometimes, sometimes you need to fix, sometimes you need to find flaws. Sometimes you need to come up with new ideas. Sometimes you need to think about morale. You got to be able to do all three in the right moments to be a well-rounded leader. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you, you know, once you realize where your tendencies are, you can kind of steer some of your intentional uh, uh, language choice and action choice to kind of kind of gear you to be a more well-rounded um, leader and have a better approach for your team. Yeah. And you can, you can ask your team, right. You can, you know, get the audio book or, you know, print mm -hmm. book, whatever. And you go to your team and your next team meeting and say, Hey everybody, I'm reading this. There's a chapter in this book, fixer, fighter, friend. Here's what a fixer is. Here's what a fighter is. Here's what a friend is. Which one am I? And <laughs> what's good. What's good about that. And what's not so good about that. And, you know, have some laughs. Like, like the, good, they, the good news is they already know the answer. Uh, and so, you know, we might as well pop the bubble and then you can have an open conversation about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jonathan, man, I really appreciate having you on. I, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I uh, appreciate your book. And again, people can go to refound.com slash geek to find out more. Where else can people connect with you, uh, pick up a copy of the book and learn more about the things that you're working on? 
So yeah, refound.com, I think they put it up at uh, refound.com slash a geek leader. Uh, we've got our one-on-one -on -one meeting guide. Uh, there's a code there to access uh, our, our primary video course uh, with some discount there. You can reach out to us if you wanna talk about your organization or a lot of the work we do, we work with, a, with an individual leader like a CTO or uh, um, you know, can be non-engineering as well, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we like to work with a leader and the people around them uh, as a really nice way to shift culture. We don't, doesn't have to be with the whole organization, although sometimes that's the case. Um, so you can find all that stuff at uh, refound.com slash a geek leader. And then good authority, you can pick up anywhere, wherever you buy books. Of course, you know, the big A, you can find it on Amazon, uh, but, you know, anywhere else you find books. And um, the audio, a lot of people really like the audio book because what I found out is that a lot of authors don't read their own books. I happen to read my own books uh, and people like that. So uh, yes, if you're an audiobook yes, person, you so uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hear my voice. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for that. Because it's really weird when, uh, and I've had guests on before that I've checked out their audio book, I listen to it, and then I go to interview them like, whoa, this isn't the same guy. And then it just, yeah, it's it, it taints like the whole the whole conversation feels like a little, little weird. <laughs> so I uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, definitely check that out. It'll also be linked up at geekleader.com with books from our guests. So people can get a copy there as well. And uh, Jonathan, again, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also, don't forget to check out merch. We have some t-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geekleader.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also, don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.